you. So good afternoon and thank you Phil for that very kind introduction. Really what I'm going to try and tell you this afternoon is everything you wanted to know about nanotechnology but we're afraid to ask. It'll be a fairly free-ranging talk but it's really going to try and explain to you why size has become important in an entirely different way in understanding the properties of matter from the way that it was when I was an undergraduate 40 years ago. So it's about relatively new areas of science and the fact that they impact on us already. And so we begin. So I'm going to talk about the origin of the area and, 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 and how you can trace it back, not just in recent history, but into antiquity. I'm going to talk about the concepts of length that we use and try and just remind you of length scales. I'm going to talk about the structure of matter and how as we get very small, things start to behave differently and how we begin to exploit those properties. Most of our great achievements to date do not uh, exploit the properties of matter at a very, very short length scale. Um, the solid state laser is one of the few things that directly uses quantum mechanics in something that we do. But nanotechnology is ancient. I never let anybody tell you that there's anything really new. This is a picture of the Lysurgus cup, a Roman artifact from about 4 AD. And you'll see as it flickers now from reflecting light to transmitting light, it changes colour. And you get that red colour, not the golden colour of gold. And that red colour is the trace of the change in the properties of the surface of gold when it's about composed of particles that are about four nanometers. And it's from the suffix nano that nanotechnology has derived its name. And I'll explain what that is as we go along. Nano is hence not a new concept. And probably the first person to really study small particles of this kind was Michael Faraday. And this shows in the middle here uh, a sample of uh, gold, a gold subcolloidal particle made by Michael Faraday in 1850s, 1856, I think. And that was an image taken by John Myrig Thomas when he was director of the Royal Institution. And you can see the laser, the white line going across the laser there, is, is, is a trace of the scattering of the laser. And that's a sample that's been stable, you know, for 170 years or so. And it's the same kind of material that's in the Lysurgis cup. But Faraday suggested that these were very small. There are lots of other famous names, Oswald and many people, Tyndall, were involved in this area. But Faraday suggested these were special because they were very small. But very small has been used in antiquity. The Mesopotamians coloured glass. The Egyptians used nanodimensional lead sulphide to make black eye makeup. Not very good for you, actually, nanodimensional lead sulphide. Perhaps one of the most interesting areas, and particularly in Manchester, which is obsessed with um, many things, but particularly with the flat form of carbon called graphene, a nano form of carbon, uh, nanocarbons are important both in the samurai sword and in the famous sword of Damascus. So artisan crafts, which we didn't understand until quite recently, have been exploiting materials of very low length scales. Most people tra trace um, the current sort of obsession with the area, and the guy who pointed it out was this, the, the resounding genius of the last century, uh, Richard Feynman, Professor Richard Feynman, Nobel Laureate for Quantum Electrodynamics. And he wrote a, a lecture, he was an interesting guy because he, was, he, he, he made some brilliant discoveries, and then he, he spent a lot of time working with students and checking things and looking for new things. Never quite found something as good as his initial theory. But he had great ideas, and his first idea was a lecture, or the one that's remembered best for is this lecture in 1959 to the American Physics, Physical Society called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And he issued two challenges. Now, I have to give you a warning at this stage that there will be questions in this lecture, and I do expect them to be answered, but there will be prizes. <laughs> Preference will be given to young people, but it won't be prejudicial. So... The two challenges that Feynman um, issued were to, to, to make um, an electric motor, I think within a 64th of a square inch. And, um, and the second one, these were based on making smaller things than were then known, and the second one was to write essentially somewhere around the scale of atoms. 
The second one was only solved in the year of his death and he saw the images of atoms that were produced then for the first time, individual atom images by a new form of microscopy. And he sat at the back of a lecture theatre, one, the, one of the guys chattering next to him, he said, shut up, that's atoms, it's beautiful, I've waited all my life to see that. The first one was solved rapidly and the first question, now I don't want to take a lot of time over this, is to ask somebody in the audience, preferably who hasn't seen the lecture before, what was the profession of the man who walked in with this tiny electric motor? What did he do? He held a profession which was highly revered. He was a kind of engineer. He was a person, a very common person. Very, very common skill, especially in the 50s. And going back a few years, I haven't got all, all the time in the world to talk to you about. <laughs> what do you think he did for a living? It was a Swiss watchmaker. I can't possibly give you a bucky ball, but I'm going to give one to your son. <laughs> See, it was worth sitting next to you, guys. <laughs> there you are. Yeah, he was a Swiss watchmaker. And it's interesting, this guy was a really, really clever guy. And he got that wrong, you see, because, because of the scale that people <coughs> could work under a microscope. These very clever engineers, really. So it's, so, it, it's this kind of yin and yang story. Where are we now? Well, nano is everywhere, and nano is not just like most of the things that become popular in science. It, it's not just uh, a science, uh, an area of science defined precisely. It's also something that's become part of marketing. And these various images are the um, iPod nano top left. Underneath it, a pair of nano trousers. These are, not, these are not renowned for their dimensions, but they're covered with nano dimensional uh, super hydrophobic materials. Now, I have a friend who, when nanotechnology first came to the fore as being anything people talked about about 15, 20 years ago, did a lot of work for the then DTI, sort of trying to explain to audiences like that's what it is, often in rotary clubs and things, and often with wine present. You see. So he used to drink wine and give his lecture. It's not that good here, but never mind. And he would throw the glass of wine over his trousers, you see. And he said the trousers were fine after 10 lectures, but he wrecked a lot of carpets. <laughs> so then this is the Tata. Tata, the Tata, the Indian uh, conglomerate that now make Jaguars, that's their nano car. And I was giving this talk or a different version of it in India one day, and it was funny, the headline of the Hindustan Times at the weekend was the colour magazine was Across India in a nano. This is a, one of those Tagamuchi pets which people had, uh, you know, where you have to feed them and things, and that's called a nano puppy. But it's also got itself expressed in literature. And I was going to show you two books, because they're interesting. And, and they're both entertaining reads, of perhaps of the holiday variety. This one is um, by the normally excellent Michael Crichton, um, probably best known to people now for Jurassic Park. But he wrote a very good science fiction book called um, The Andromeda Strain. And this book, Prey, is a rewrite of it. It deals with an idea, and one of the ideas which has pervaded public thinking about nanotechnology is the idea that there's some intrinsic danger and it's unnatural. I'll try and show that it's definitely not unnatural and I'll try and explain the risks in perspective. But this was due to a book called The Engines, I think, of Invention by a man called Drexler who later recounted on what he said where he described very small silicon robots taking over the world and turning, turning it all into something he called grey goo. Various distinguished people have been impressed by this, including the Prince of Wales. Um, Anyway, this, this, this book deal, takes that to its extreme. And nanobots kill people and try to take over the world. Now, I think that this is extremely unlikely to happen in my lifetime, the lifetime of the grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren of anyone in this room. So it's a, it's a slightly, in my view, irrational fear of nanotechnology. So people are killed by nanobots in this one. Bad job, Michael. Now, both called Michael. Michael Connolly. Michael Connolly... Um, writes very superior detective uh, novels set in California, mainly in uh, Los Angeles. And um, this one deals with an entrepreneur in nanotechnology, a man called Henry Pierce. And Henry Pierce discovers a way of powering very small objects. And later in the lecture, I'm going to show you an example of how you could perhaps power things. Because one of the greatest problems people have is to ha if you make a very, very small robot and you put it into the bloodstream to do some internal surgery, how do you power it? And, and, and what, what, what's the change in mechanics? There's a question coming up on hydrodynamics in the nanosphere. I'm expecting answers. You know. 
Um, but, but it's an interesting thing to think about, and you can think about it. And anyway, he devises this way of powering small objects. And people in this book are killed primarily for reasons to do with money or sex. And my contention is that you will hear of many people killed for those reasons during your lifetime. And so those are far more dangerous subjects in which to involve yourself than nanotechnology. Anyway, there are lots of other things. I bought this vacuum cleaner recently, which is called a Hoover Nano. And you can buy even these nano bugs. Um, and these are kind of, you can buy a great vivarium for them to live in. And some of them have even got little uh, radio controls in them so that they avoid each other because I think they can kill each other and things. But they kind of charge around rather lunatically, you see, like this. But the word nano is it's kind of a word that, as I say, has obsessed everyone from toy manufacturers uh, through to Apple, you know, people name, and, and Tata. It's, it's become a fashionable word and also a word about which there's also paranoia. And just to be precise, nano is a, is a word derived from the Greek, which means dwarf, dwarfish, pygmy. It means little old man. In many European languages, it's a word actually which also can mean kind of kind old uncle. It's kind of an affectionate term. But technically in science, it isn't a word at all. It's a, a prefix in, used in the um, system uh, which we measure things through, the Systems International for measuring things. And, and the SI units, uh, it's quite funny, whenever I cut a piece of wood at, at home, I, I, I work in um, feet and inches still, being a very old man. But I, I always find that the, 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 the units that actually make explaining the distance of the stars and the moon and the size of the earth and the size of a football, which I'll talk, on the same scale, actually are not very good when you're cutting a piece of 12-inch wood. I don't have any feel for what, what, what that means. I have to convert it. Anyway, about 39 inches is a metre. So there's a metre. You're all familiar with a metre. And there are a few grey hairs in the audience, I noticed. So that's what a metre looks like, in case you don't know. And the great thing, and that, so that's, that's the principal unit of length in the metric system. And the smallest division on this ruler is a millimetre. And that's one of the rules. That, that the units which are approved for use, the centimetre isn't an approved unit. You can talk about them, but it's not a unit that we use in science. A one thousandth. So I think it's quite easy to say. See that? There's, there's a, you can see the smallest division if you've got very good eyesight at the back, that's a millimetre. It's a thousandth of a metre. Now, in Manchester, because um, we're in Manchester today, I'll make an aside, a very famous man um, called Whitworth was one of the first engineers in the world to start to define the distance which is a thousandth times smaller than an inch. And he would produce what conventional precision engineering. So it's the same order of magnitude, we'd say, as a thousandth of um, a millimetre. So a thousandth of an inch is a thousandth of 2.5 centimetres, which is a unit we don't use. But it, that's the, the dimension of conventional engineering. And he discovered how you could measure that. And more than that, he was able to make planes of metal. He too became a fellow of the Royal Society, actually for making flat planes of metal that were within a few nanometers. So we introduced two new units now. If a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter, a thousandth of a millimeter is a micrometer, also called a micron. And that's kind of the end of the world of the conventional engineer. Now, Phil's a very non-conventional engineer, but really that's where material science stopped when, when we were young. It was the science that looked at things at that length scale, partly because it was what was accessible. And what's happened in the last <coughs> 20 years in my scientific lifetime, 30 years, is that the level, which is 1,000 times smaller, so that's a thousandth of a millionth of a meter, or a millionth of a millimeter. And that's the nanometer. And it's, it's a particularly interesting scale, uh, length scale to look at, and it's one at which the properties of matter become interesting and where, you know, everybody thinks of gold. If you imagine gold, why is gold so valued by man? Because it doesn't tarnish, because it doesn't react. But in the last few years, gold has become widely used as a catalyst in chemical reactions because nanoparticles of gold have got splendid levels of activity, not a property of the bulk metal, one associated entirely with size. So it's, it's a, this, this thing is that size does matter. 
And I, I have this little thing that I sometimes talk about, which is, and there is a prize going, if you've not seen the lecture before, this man here, if you can tell me who he is, then you can have a bookie ball to take home. But on the top left is Harry Crotos now 27 or 28-year-old, Croto small and curly, Buckminster Fullerene, a new allotrope of carbon. For, terribly exciting if you're a chemist for somebody to discover a new allotrope. Very similar time, um, Ernst and Schmitzworth at IBM uh, developed the scanning tunning electron microscope and that was the first thing that gave us access to these images at the close to the atomic level and there are reasons why we're becoming interested in this and the reason is associated with the man there and it's to do with the technology that impresses all our lives it's to do with the microprocessor and the chip that's in all of the computers including the one that I'm using and the answer is that as we all know computers have got faster and faster and there was a man who's there, anyone who works for Intel, any ideas? More. Who said that? Who said more? Please. Who said more? You could have a bookie ball for that. There we go, yes, Mr. Moore, Moore's Law. Um, well done. Please don't volunteer for the MCC. Uh, Mr. Moore suggested that the speed of computers doubled about every eight years and, and more or less they've kept up with that. Well you imagine how do you double the speed of a computer? Well it's easy. In order for something to happen in a computer something, an electron, has to move from A to B and change a state. So how do you do that twice as fast? You make the distance half as long. So we start off, um, you can imagine if you start off with dimensions which are 500 nanometers, so half a micron, you keep halving it, you soon get to very short lengths and they're now down to fabrication lengths that are better measured in nanometers and which change all the time. But when you get to those length scales, the properties of matter start to change and that's one of the stories I'll try and tell you. So this is Mr. Moore and this is Moore's Law um, and, and it really is, you know, it, it's incredibly the high art of the last century, um, the making of, of, of small devices. And we're still making progress but the fundamentals of the technology have not changed yet. But when you think about it, that this fact, which is on the Intel webpage, is the one that astonishes me. It's a little circle around a single letter of print in a daily newspaper in the USA. And the cost of printing one letter in the Observer on Sunday, ballpark figure, is the same as the cost as making one transistor in one of those chips. Now, if you compare the complexity of taking some ink and putting it on a page to make an image, with making a, a transistor which has got six, seven, eight different materials in it in precise arrangements with the ability to connect to the outside world. It's amazing. And that's what, what we achieved. It's probably the most complicated, or one of the most complicated things we've ever achieved. And this is a friend of mine, Steve Ferber, who's here, who is working on new, new computers. And of course the first computer program was run in Manchester on a machine called Baby just after the Second World War. And it could execute 700 basically instructions a second. It used 3.5 kilowatts of energy. So the latest and the, one of the most sensational companies in the UK is a company called Arm, which Steve and a couple of other people were the people who invented what are called reduced instruction set processors, RISC processors. And the latest one of these is the Arm. And it has fabrication features down to 130 nanometers. It uses 40 milliwatts of electricity and it executes 200 million instructions a second. Now, it's actually 25 times 10 to the 9 times more energy efficiency. Imagine if cars efficiency had improved by that much. <laughs> so it, it's an amazing thing, but you can put these together and what, what they do now is put these things together into arrays and try and look at the way, I think there's a lecture later on about that, uh, look at how we can do that. So a million Spinnaker chips in an array gives you about 1% of the computing power of a human brain, but in a different form, because actually it's faster, but it's less efficient. So the interesting fact that Steve told me is that, you know, a million chips is 1% of a human brain's power, but it's about 10 mouse brains. So that's quite interesting. Anyway, that's, that's, that's where this has led us in our journey. Nanotechnology is generally divided into to two things, uh, or to two, two approaches, and th this is, these are words you'll see, a bottom-up approach and top-down. And bottom-up is when you start out 
and you build something from a small scale. And this is one of these beautiful scanning tunneling electron microscope images. And this is individual atoms of iron in a corral on the surface of copper metal. And what you're seeing here is the waves of electron density with a single iron at the center. You're actually seeing the, the, the waveform associated with the electrons. You're seeing quantum mechanics, just as simply as if you'd thrown a pebble into the middle of a pond. These are carbon nanotubes out on the left, which are built from carbon atoms and which can have junctions. And the junctions that you develop there have electrical properties similar to transistors, so you can make switches. And this bottom-up approach, you know, goes back to Mesopotamia. It's actually one of Andre Geim's slides I stole from him many years ago. Top-down is where we, we do what we largely do in making things now. We do it by having an image of things, and it's used to make things like chips and processors, and really traces itself to the transistor, <coughs> and that's a picture of the first transistor made in Bell Labs in 1947. And of course it's got ever more sophisticated, and uh, you can see here, this is at the turn of the century, 42 million transistors, 180 nanometers. This was a famous hoax, I don't know if you can read that. It says Bill sucks, and that was supposed to be on a Pentium chip, it got into the New York Times. I've seen people give this in lectures, it was a complete hoax. But uh, I don't know what it means, but if anybody can translate it for me, please do tell me. At this point, the computer usually crashes. So this is lens scales, and trying to explain things that you might come across, you know, an animal cell, 10 microns, a bacterium, a micron, a protein, these are proteins, 10 nanometers across roughly, a, col a large colloidal particle of the kind that are in uh, highly reflective strips. Um, no, I haven't got one there. Apologies to the photographer. Uh, uh, the highly reflective strips that you sometimes have on running shoes or the back of rucks racks have uh, that size particle. And then small dye molecules, just to give you an idea of a scale. So how small can we really get? And I think atoms are the clue. And uh, there's another prize that question here. This is a picture of Alice. I think Alice through the looking glass and she's saying what a curious feeling I'm shutting up like a telescope. And I always like to ask people at this stage in the lecture, you know, do you think it's possible, I've got a bottle of a potion here, that if I give you this and you drink it, do you think it's possible that you could shrink like Alice? Do you think that's something we could achieve? And w w but somebody in the audience, why not? Any idea why? I have a very primitive view of why. Any ideas? Well, how, how would it occur? If you're going to shrink somebody, then actually you have to shrink what they're made of. If they're, going to, they're just going to become a smaller version of themselves. Now, there is a way of doing that. You can drop them into a black hole, and the gravity gets bigger, and they will shrink. It's an experiment described in uh, Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawkins. Trouble is you can never hear back from them if it's happening and working because you can get nothing out of it. And actually you don't really know what happens to them. But you know, people do think they'll pop out in another universe. But it's because actually atoms and bonds, like this picture of carbon in a sheet, these lengths are defined by the nature of atoms and, and the fields that we live within. So you can't change those. So you can't change, just miniaturize people. You know, because the, 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 the molecules that enable us to breathe have sizes that are defined. So if you wanted to re-engineer people to be smaller, you'd have to change the biochemistry. It just wouldn't work. At the, so it's, it's length dependent. It's length dependent because atoms have size. And William Blake realized this, you know, because he said to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wildfire, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. He sort of thought, you know, thought about what could, what could be achieved. So how small can we make things? Well, conventionally making powders, it cuts off at around about a micron. You can argue about, so that's about the millionth of a metre. What emerged uh, from about 1986 onwards, um, and, and I was quite involved in, was, were methods for making particles that are very small. And the beautiful image on the right has been reproduced hundreds of times, sometimes with my permission in books and journals, uh, is a picture of a, a particle of a, a cadmium selenide. It doesn't really matter what it is. But the, the distance between the white lines there, the diameter of it, is about four nanometers. So 4,000 millionths of a meter. <coughs> 
it's going to be composed of a number that's a few thousand atoms. And these things then develop unique properties. And I'm going to show those to you because a picture's worth a thousand words. But I'll just tell you one more thing now, that they're possible to make these things because actually we, this is, we, put, we put soap onto the surface. We put an organic molecule onto the top, which is very similar to the stuff that, that you find in soap. And that holds onto the surface and it makes the, the, the entity stable. It's a trick from colloid chemistry. These are, not, these are almost sub-colloidal particles. And you make them like chemicals. And, and you know, you take some selenium, you, you reduce it, doesn't, all the detail doesn't matter, but you boil it up. You do what people think of as high school chemistry, and you make these materials with remarkable optical and electronic properties. This was some work done in Africa by a couple of my collaborators making uh, lead selenide. And uh, they can make these particles in, you know, all of those syntheses are reproducible. And you can see they've got different size lengths. And we can make different sizes, the different sizes have different properties. And you can reproduce them make these beautiful rods. And I'll, keep, I'll show you images of these. These are taken. But why bother? Well, the reason to bother is because these length scales are important. And I think that the, the century we're now living in is going to see us making greater use of particles that are small in functional application. And one of the early applications, and one which is moving along rapidly, is the fact that because as they get shorter, they change colour. Um, so if the particle is coloured, if it's actually a semiconductor, and I'll show you an energy diagram in a minute, it changes colour. Now, it's easy to access the relationship between length scale and things like colour if you remember that light has a frequency. And so let me demonstrate a different relationship between length and colour. It's so simple. Right. You can hear a low frequency noise. When I make that short, Five times out of ten, I break the rule. <laughs> but you can hear that the nature of the, the beast has changed. And, and basically what's happening is that electrons within the solid have a characteristic wavelength. And when they're floating around in a, a, a piece of material, and large in this scale is a piece that's more than 100 nanometers across. So, you know, this is way below conventional sizes that you can make. In a particle that's five nanometers across, the electron is intensely aware of the boundaries that stop it getting outside of the material. In, in a simple way, it can get out, but that's because of quantum mechanics. So it's there. So it's intensely aware. And the atoms actually have different characters because many of them are on the surface. Once it becomes bigger, then actually it's a bit like people, you know, except. It's, um, it's the opposite of the Monty Python joke. If you ask an atom, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 you know every, every, every individual human being is different, but actually every atom is the same and indistinguishable in a normal sized piece of solid material. And that, so that change changes the nature of the material. And it, one of the effects is this effect on the frequency of light that can be generated from it. And that's a diagram that shows you what happens. That, the band separation gets bigger, but I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm going to show you it. So I'm going to skip over these. Well, yeah, I'll, yeah, I will skip over those for a minute. This is a, a video I made earlier today, and this shows that effect. So these are some samples made by Chris Page in my group last week, and they're a new, they're a new kind of material. They're, they're a form of cadmium telluride. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter, but you can see, I'll, I'll, I can actually show you, can you see that effect there? That as I shine this ultraviolet light, so you can't really see that light actually. What you're seeing is a reflection off the back. The light's black light. As I shine the light through them, they emit light that's at a colour. And these particles are from about 3 nanometers in size to about 4 nanometers in size. As the particles get larger, the energy of the light they emit, they emit becomes uh, lower. And so you start off with a material, for example, that maybe has a, a very narrow band gap. It might appear black because it ad absorbs all radiation. As you cut it into smaller and smaller pieces, that will move across the visible region. And that's one of the excitements, is this link. Because as human beings, we're fascinated by things we can see. And so we measure that. So at the top is a, a spectrum of light from red light through to, you know, Richard of York gave battle in vain. And this peak here shows the absorption of the light by a quantum dot.
And this is the quantum dot I'm going to show you in the next slide. And basically, one the experiment that interests people enormously is that if you shine light into a quantum dot, which is of higher energy than the characteristic energy, light comes out. And so this is the light in spectrum, the absorption. This is the light out, the luminescence. And that's important. I'll show you how it's important here. That's the dots I've shown you there. What they are is not terribly important. But this is a picture of some lymphocytes. And those quantum dots have been made so they will bind to the surface of the cell. And if you look at the right, these are cells that proliferate in certain kinds of cancer. If you look on the right, you can see that's just what you see if you look down a microscope. And people count those cells and machines count those cells. And you can see the slightly out of focus ones are very hard to see, so they'd be easy to miss. So you tag some dye onto them and you do exactly this, and it was a red dye. It's exactly the same as this. Uh, once you turn the, the light on, you get bright red emission from the cells that are bound. And so that makes them easier to count by machine. And that's the only thing you can actually buy quantum dots for at the moment. They're made by a company called Invitrogen. And it uses very small amounts of dots. But what you have to remember is that they're excellent at changing the colour of light. And so one of the things that um, you know... I'm sorry, I didn't bring a torch today. I don't think I've got a torch in my bag. But these little light-emitting diode torches that are everywhere, that especially with the can cranks and the solar cells on, this bright garish shot, they're very, very easy and cheap to make. And they're what I call a Henry Ford product. Henry Ford said you can have a car any colour you want, provided it's black. And you can have any one, uh, LED mass-produced in any arrangement you want, provided it's this horrible garish blue that's produced by gallium nitride. It's not strictly true, but they're very easy and very cheap. And so, but the great thing about blue light is it's high energy. So you can change blue into red, green, and a different blue. And so there's a whole new way of making a, a display which isn't a liquid crystal, it isn't a plasma screen, which is based. And that's actually the thing that my company is really working towards, is, is colour change technologies. And there's just the commercial break. So I'm going to move into the final phase, which really says how did this all come about. Well, here's a very topical ent entity in Manchester. And um, I, I, need, I need three volunteers now. I normally like to find a small volunteer, a large volunteer, and a medium-sized one. So I normally pick children of different sizes when I do this. But uh, you, you're all probably going to be on the smaller side, so you can be there. And uh, you might have to stand up. You don't mind helping, do you? Well, you can be, uh, be, um, be medium-sized, and you can be large. It's about fair, isn't it? <laughs> so what you're going to do is stand up those, stand up and hold those objects above your head. Now, and turn around to face the camera, I'm afraid. I hope you don't mind being filmed. I should probably ask you. Now then, you, can, you can, can all tell me what those are. So what's, what's the... Actually, that's interesting. You're very politically correct. You're holding the globe upside down. <laughs> That's hence de-emphasising imperialism. It's very impressive. Aaron Sorkin would be proud of him. Um, anyway, it's, um, it's, it's the Earth. And the middle one is, of course, the only object that's sacred. It's a football. In, in that, those three I'm pointing out. And the final one is C60, the form of carbon discovered by Croto, Small and Curley, which is 60 atoms in exactly the same arrangement as the corners of that football. So they're exactly the same. Now, I've been talking about length, and here's an idea. This is one of Harry Croto's students came up with this. I've forgotten his name, but Harry uses this all the time. If you want to try and understand how small things are, you can get all the, the ratio of the diameters is almost the same between the earth and a football and a buckyball and the earth. And a buckyball is almost, it's about 0 0.86, 0 0.9 of a nanometer, but the level we're dealing at, call it a nanometer across. So a one nanometer object, you can get as many of those spheres into a football as you can get footballs into the earth. Now, Feynman's lecture was called, there's plenty of room at the bottom. I think that's quite a graphic way of thinking. So I'll give them a round of applause. <laughs> yeah. You've already got a prize, but you can have prizes. For oh, sorry. <laughs> Not doing well there. But that's very good. And th there's a picture. Um, and, and this is a picture, actually, of uh, the late, great uh, Rick Smalley here, who was a fabulous person, Harry Croto and Curl. Um, and, and they named this object after the man there on the left who was Buckminster Fuller, uh, Buckminster Fullerene. And it, and it was one of the iconic objects that led to people becoming interested. 
There's a great video of people making Buckminster Fullerines in Mexico and using them as hats. And Harry shows this. He did a workshop with school kids, which he loves to do. And he says, these kids are great because they've got the half bucky balls and they put them on their heads. And he says, they've actually found the use for it. <laughs> actually, narrow rods are more... Anyway, this also points out that there's nothing new. Now, this is a, a, an exodus into Renaissance art. This is a picture of... Uh, the, the leaders of Florence at the time, Federigo de Montefalatro and his wife Battista Sforza. And it's in the Effusi Museum presented in 1456 by Piero della Francesca. This is all very relevant. Now, this artist, they paid him a lot of money to do those pictures. I always worry about that he was slightly taking the Michael, don't you? Not the Michelangelo, they don't look like David. Anyway, he sketched this, and this was the shape, uh, the icosahedron known to, um, known to the ancient Greeks. And this is his sketch of that shape. So this shape was a well-known shape in mathematics and philosophy. And you wouldn't really have guessed, would you, that the first time it was printed was, I think, in 1496 in a book you can find in the Vatican Library, and that's a, an image of the page. So there's nothing new. And, 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 and the book, book Mr. Florian fascinates me because many people could have discovered it if, if they'd looked in the right place. Faraday had all the tools to discover the bright red form of carbon. Uh, he had the tools, he discovered benzene, he had arc, um, carbon arcs. Tubes are another thing you can make. So a, a, a bookie ball is 60 in a row. But you can take this kind of structure and you can curl it round to make a tube, as you can see. And these became a very important area. And these are, near, these are getting towards application in uh, light emitting systems and all kinds of things. But of course, carbon's become a material of some obsession. And this is a bucky tube with a kink in a nanotube. It has electronic properties, makes you think you can make very small things. So Andrei Gaiman, Kostya Novotsilov, um, received the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for, for discovering that you can make single sheets of graphene. And these have astonishing electrical properties. It's really the most amazing thing is the, the way the electron moves within that plane. And these are relatively easy to make. But let me show you something that, that, that you may not know. So one of the interesting things is the way that shape uh, relates to properties and, and flatness is, is a very important parameter in this. And so I've just got here, so these, this structure is it's made by taking graphite and making it a single layer. And you can see it's got a six-membered ring, very characteristic form of carbon, like the molecule benzene, where each one will be finished by hydrogen. And that's per se a flat structure. What's interesting is that if you look at the uh, buckyball, um, that has five-membered rings and six-membered rings. If you look at what happens as soon as you put a five-membered ring into this structure, I've got another one somewhere, there it is, it cannot be flat. See, that structure is intrinsically curved. And if you look at our friend the tortoise, you can actually, if with the eye of faith, see that the tortoise shell has got hexagonal plates and five-membered plates. And the structure has got a lot to do with what it's built from. And what it turns out that when you bend these, you change the symmetry, and you actually radically change the properties. And so if we look at uh, our buckyball, oh, God on you, thank you very much. This is actually composed, this one's travelled a bit, let me find a good one. This is composed, you can see there, a six-membered ring, and next to it, a five-membered ring. And if you're really good and look through it, you can see that the five-membered ring at this side is the opposite way up to the one at that side. So if I do that, there's a, something called a rotation reflection plane of symmetry. But brilliant, sh brilliant object. And, you know, one of the most beautiful things discovered since I've been practicing science. But tortoises knew all about it. You can make these things out of uh, inorganic compounds, which, of course, is far superior to making them out of carbon for reasons I can only explain to you on the basis of prejudice, because I'm an inorganic chemist. And, and these are, are, are tubes made out of a flat material called molybdenum sulfide by Reshef Tene in the Weizmann Institute in Israel. And these are added, uh, molybdenum sulfide is a, is a lubricating material, like graphite, because graphite can slide over each other. These tubes are used to go into grease, uh, to, to greases, and it makes them have better properties as lubricants. And they're actually the kind of greases that they use to slide ships down the slipway. So you do have the concept or possibility of some of the smallest ever designed man-made objects 
being used to move the largest ever design man-made objects, which appeals to my sense of humour. This is the humble bit. Always remember that whatever we think we do and however good we think we are, that biology was there first. And this is a picture of uh, a tendon. And a tendon in your arm that enables you to move is made up of structures. And the really fascinating thing is you go across that slide to the left hand end, it's made up of helices at the end of proteins. And this continuity of structure uh, from the size of the atom through to the the bulk structure gives, I think, unique engineering principles, which I think I think Phil would agree. We don't fully exploit that in, in understanding things like composites. You know, we've got our first composites at aircraft. But we're basically in the Bronze Age of composites. And biology is interstellar or something. I don't know. Anyway, but, but, but biology also can do amazing things. It, it makes motors that work at this very short length scale. And this is an ATP motor and it burns energy effectively, and it rotates. Now, a form of that rotating protein um, is responsible, this is a picture of paramecium, for these little flagella that whip around. And that's burning energy, so these things can swim. And what's m even more interesting to me uh, is that, that, that some organisms that live in the mud at the bottom of ponds have little magnets in them. And these magnets uh, are all, so that's about, um, the little bar on each of those is, a, is 100 nanometers or so. So the smallest ones at the top left are something like 10 nanometers across. These are lumps of, usually of magnetic oxides or magnetic sulfides made from iron. And they line those up. You can see they're all lined up. And they're like little bar magnets. And so it turns out that the force on that bar magnet is able, to, is, is able to respond, because the object's so small, is sufficient to steer the organism downwards, and that's where its nutrients are. And so it's a steering thing. And there's a quick video here, which shows these are some of these bacteria swimming around, and you can see when you put the magnet on, they swim, all swim away. When you put it, switch it around, they swim back. And they're just following the magnetic field. And so, you know, we think we're clever. I, I, I was the first person in the world to make a, a mineral called gregite, which mineralogists like. Which, it, it, it was five nanometers size and was a single crystal. It was very pure. Bacteria have been doing it for millions and millions of years. And, and, you know, we think we're good. So it's interesting. This is another magnetic material, which is a... And it just shows the kind of beautiful images that we get from our electron microscopes. This is... This is a, a, now an old uh, HRT, and we get even better ones now. And you can see the material is shaped as a rod, and it's about four nanometers across. We can do diffraction experiments. That's a picture of, at the top of an assembly of them, to show them they all look the same. But one Sunday afternoon, I was bored, and uh, I took some of these, and I, I put them in a little vial uh, with um, a magnetic bar. And uh, so what I'm going to do now is shake... So they're, they're magnetic, so they're all stuck to the magnetic bar. So I'm going to shake it, and you'll see that they've flown off the bar. And you can see they all fly back to the bar. But what's interesting is it slows down towards the end. Then. They're all starting to follow the lines of force and line themselves up on the surface. I remember when I was a kid shaking magnetic filings and following the pattern, but they, that's a video of the same phenomenon. So I'll finish with a final, I think, or biological example or two. And this, again, involves questions. This is, this is a system that looks into this problem of moving things. And uh, Paxton and others at um, Penn State did this work about seven or eight years ago now. But it points one way of driving very small objects. So they made these things. They're about 500 nanometers. They're little rods that are composed of gold and platinum. And, and gold and platinum are different metals with different properties. And basically, if you put platinum into a solution that contains H2O2, at the top there, hydrogen peroxide, it produces bubbles of oxygen. And you can see there, bubbles of oxygen coming off one end of the rod, but not the other. So they did this. I'm not quite sure why they did it, but they thought it might work. And um, so if you put some of those rods into um, water, then you can see, this is just real-time image under an optical microscope. They're just about big enough to see. You can see they're all banging around. They're, they're moving. 
Now this is a, a motion that's well known in physics. It's one of the first things you study in physics at school, or used to be. It's called Brownian motion. And it's because all the water molecules, when they bang into these small objects, there's a recoil. And so they vibrate. They don't move in any set direction. So if we take our system now, and we drop these rods into hydrogen, some hydrogen peroxide, perhaps something different will happen. And can you see they start to swim around? They look like little animals, don't they? I mean, it, I think it's quite cute. But it shows that you can drive things. And you can even do better than that. Uh, they put them on the surface of a cog and put some studs, and so that will fly around. Finally, perhaps more interestingly, they made the rods magnetic, and so you can then steer them. So no field on, magnetic field on. You can see they start to go in lines. See the one going across. So these little magnetic rods. So not only can you power these, but you can move them. So the question I'm going to ask you, and this is probably possibly the last question, is these little rods. So here's a little rod. And one end is different from the other. So one end of this little rod is producing bubbles. And the other end isn't. Which way does the rod move? Towards the bubbles or away from the bubbles? Anybody think it might move towards the bubbles? Yeah, you've already won a bucky ball. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody know? Anybody any ideas? It, it, it's, it's shown, actually, I've, I've lost the slide, actually, in this talk. It's shown, actually, in a video. Um, the phenomenon is shown in a video with a, a, a film called Ants, with Woody Allen in it, as the voice of an ant where he gets stuck inside a bubble of water and he can't get out. Because the relative importance of forces as you change length scales is not the same. And so it turns out that, that, that if it was a macroscopic object, you'd imagine it being like a jet engine and firing away. But actually what it does is it blows a hole into the end, at the end of it, and the surface tension pushes the rod into it. So it's counterintuitive. And, 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 and they managed to show that in some rather clever experiments. So it, it's, it's, very, it's an interesting explanation or idea that things are different when you go to small scale. So Feynman's second challenge is sort of where I start to finish, you know, to write things, and this is Egler and Schreiser of IBM wrote Big Blue. Uh, I think in xenon atoms on a surface, it also enabled all these sensational images. If you want to see these, there's actually a... It's called the, the, a gallery of these you can look at, and they're, they're absolutely stunning images. This one I always find spooky, because this is making an ellipse of iron on the surface of copper and put an atom at one focus of the ellipse, but then you see a mirage at the other. That's a strange quantum mechanical effect. Um, you know, I was told about 45 minutes, yeah? Oh, dear. <laughs> But uh, nanotechnology, is, it, it, nano, it, it, it's an overused term. I, I, I just work on things that interest me, but I have made part of my career in making things that have got critical. The way I like to put it is critical dimensions of the order of a nanometer. I have various versions of this talk, one of which I talk in more detail about length scales. I've, I, and as I say, I've given this talk all over the world. But nanotechnology is interesting stuff. I mean, um, this is in the middle is a, a, an article, I think, that featured without asking us that dot I showed you earlier. This is a book series I edit on nanoscience, a, a major textbook on it, uh, some of our things on a journal cover. This one's the one I like to talk about, though, top right. Red Herring. About the time we were starting the company, 2003, this was a magazine, and it was intended to enable people to spot red herrings so that they would only invest in hot new technologies. This whole issue was dedicated to nanoscience and technology. Now, the only interesting thing about that is that the magazine was actually run by venture capitalists. It was funded by venture capitalists and run by venture capitalists, and it went bust. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you're all laughing. Um, but it's serious stuff. It's going to somehow impact on all our lives in the next few years. And so I'd like to thank you for listening, uh, but this little man made of molecules of carbon dioxide, I'd like to do it more. Not carbon monoxide, so we'd like to do it more. Thank you. <laughs>